Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 17 of The Lore You Know. Today we're talking about... 17? I know, I right? It, <laughs> it gets surprising. Um, today we are talking about the Iron Court, which is made up of the Iron Bread, and we'll get, we'll get into all of that. But before we do, first of all, hi, Sarah. How's it going? Hi. That's okay. Yay. Yay for... Yeah, I mean, at least okay. Continue in the... As we continue in the land of, of I haven't left the house barely. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. It happens, especially these days. Um, so yeah, the Iron Bread. Um, before, before we dive into the specifics of the Iron Bread, and because they have finally announced Tasha's Cauldron of Everything Whatever, I just want to make this correlation because I think that Iron Bread are like such a great example of how to take an, an, a societally evil monster race and make them good or whatever they want to be because yeah. they have choice. And you, you still can be the evil Sujak. You absolutely can. I mean, I feel like in, oh, we'll get into that in, in a second, but okay. So Watsi's going to be talking about the drow here soon, right? They're going to be saying... Have been for a while. Yeah, I mean, but they're going to... In, in Tasha's good, they're going to explain how... Yeah. How you as a player or DM can do whatever you want to with the character you want to create. And I think it's great. I'm really interested to see how they're going to phrase things. Yep. But I'll just let everyone know. Like, <laughs> here's a secret. Other people have already done this. Go look at the Scarlands. It's amazing. <laughs> And I mean, I mean, so so I mean, who who hasn't played a drow? I've played like at least two. Right, right. Um, and we were talking or about had this at least someone playing a drow in one of their games yeah. who was a goodish drow. Yeah. I mean, I, how many? Oh God, I can name like five drow PCs. And I feel like so many, so many people do pick up the, the Dritz card, and they say, you know, he's uh, my my uh, for whatever reason my good drow has escaped society and i think that's yeah, that's yeah. great um but on or a at least world my chaotic scale, neutral drow <laughs> right on a world <laughs> scale so I, I feel like so there's a lot of people who do not know why the drow are evil and it's completely fair wow. unless you actually go and read the lore no one knows so long long ago the drow were elves like normal elves and they like joined up with a goddess who was also not evil but they wanted to like overthrow some other elves and the other elf god they lost this sounds really familiar this is scarred lands you know what i mean this is the same story and when they well, lost, well i mean i would say that scarred lands stole heavily from this that is completely fair as well <laughs> but okay. The, the losers, oh, the yeah. Drow. yeah, the losers, not only got cast down, and 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 elves. So elves are technically immortal in in Faerun. They get re re uh, reincarnated as another elf. So the elf god was like, no, 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 you fucked up. You can't do this anymore. And was like, you're going, you're you're banished, and banished them underground. Now, why that made them black skinned is because of Norse know. legend, and the people who made them were like, "We're gonna steal this from the Norse dark legend, elves." Of right. Well, and, and my my bet is that they first said, "Okay, we need evil monsters," and they brought in the dark elves from right. Norse legend, and then they wrote a backstory for right. them later because yeah. that's how they made almost everything in classic D anD D was was they just grabbed creatures from mythologies all over the world and yeah. smack them all into a monster book or two and so or three and yeah. all of those original drow could very easily be argued to have been societally evil yeah they oh, didn't yeah. consider themselves evil they just wanted to have a different place in society than what the gods wanted them to have and so they stood up and they were like no and they got cast down and cursed and they no longer get to reincarnate they don't get to go through this cycle of life that elves have but that means they die and have kids, and those kids don't need to be the same evil 
You know what I mean? And so I'm hoping that's the okay, direction Watsi goes. I'm picturing, I'm picturing all these drow like in the streets now with big signs. Right. You know, I don't know what they say, but <laughs> you know, flump lives matter. I right. Don't know. Right. <laughs> and so, like, I, I, I get why the original drow were evil, but I mean, yeah, we're yeah, talking we're like millennia since that happened. And so having good drow, they could have done what we're about to talk about. So yeah. now segueing. Segway to we're in the scarred lands. People. We're in a wasted <laughs> desert. Go figure. On the scarred lands. In wasted that desert. What's and, that? And history of this desert. I mean, this is... The Akrudin is one of the three mega deserts yeah. in the scarred lands. The other two are... Um, they're about the same size. All three are about the same size, I think, in terms of maybe. Actually, no, the other two are a little bit bigger. But, but I mean, they're um, still the other all two of them are massive. Continent. Yeah, the other two are in in Ashrak. I mean, t- technically, there's some areas that you could define as desert, but not in a traditional Saharan yeah. sand everywhere. Yeah, yeah, and that that is a, a an interesting point because um, so I live. Uh, right next to some mountains that there's a plain next to, and technically our plains are considered desert plains. Yeah. Because they are not, I mean, they are like arid as fuck, but they aren't sandy. So yeah. the Akrudin is a sandy Saharan well, desert. Parts of it. It's it's like, I would, conver- I would, I would merge it, like, sort of take Sahara and take um, Mojave and just sort of, you know, the worst of both. <laughs> <laughs> the worst of both. Fair enough. <laughs> because <laughs> it's all there's there's rocky non-sandy bits but they're very mojave mojave mojave, mojave? Oh, i don't know how you, mojave? Yeah. you know the one outside of vegas yeah um uh, i only know it from playing uh fallout new vegas <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's it's kind of scrub bush uh dry land some sand but it's not yeah. like dunes and yeah yeah it's not like lawrence arabia right you know, walking over the sand dunes um i know everything from movies i never travel uh so you're traveling with your mind i have i have i know i've i've been to hawaii and i've been to the grand canyon so i have actually been to both are great places, places to go to so <laughs> yeah, i've been to, i've seen god for second level wasteland so I've, i have been to a couple of places but i have not been in I've, and i have been to vegas but i didn't go to the mob Mojave. Mojave. I can't pronounce anything. You know that. Okay, so no anyway. So, or Cruden is kind of like those deserts. Yeah. Um, very, very arid. Very, very, very hot. And there was a desert before the war, um, which, and I think the the legends go, like if you go back to one of our early, earliest episodes when we talked about the various epochs, um, after the, after Gulban's Ice Age, and everybody went underground, and then they woke up Thulkas, and Thulkas burst out and, like, created, you know, all sorts of stuff. It's implied that the Akrudin is where he burst out, um, or at least that's where he hung out um, And if you afterward. didn't see those episodes, uh, Thulkas is like a fiery titan of, of fire. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it totally makes sense. Yeah, he's, they call him the Iron Lord because he's basically a molten iron lava monster. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to go, like, yeah. play patty cake, yeah. no high five, and unless you're, no. you know, fire elemental, it's all good, but... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So th- he's, I mean, the way I picture him, he's, he's he does have a, a sort of a body of, of, that's supposed to be made of iron, but he's basically also on fire and made of, and has lava and stuff and controls fire and stuff. I think so I have was, an image, so I'll throw up an image yeah, of, of so, this here guy. Dual so cause. he was... The implication is this is pretty much where he lived or hung out, was this desert. And during the war, during the Divine War, he you know, basically boomed his power to fight um, the gods and, and the armies of the gods and whatnot. And that made the desert way worse. So it spread, and it created the sweltering plains, and it created... Um, all those other areas which used to be kind of okay and now they're really hot and horrible because Thulkas did his thing. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so big flaming iron golem looking thing. Um, except, you know, colossal. Yeah. 
Are we allowed to say Colossal in 5th edition? I mean, we should be able to because Gargantuan is not big enough. It's not big enough. I always think of Colossal as, as that scale of whatever it is, 5x5. Five five. Is it 5x5 five five grid? Yeah. Four, yeah. So, like, in 3rd in, in, in edition, they got to a point where it was, like, Colossal Plus. So yeah. <laughs> there epic was... Scale. Yeah, you kept, like, growing your grid, and then anything yeah. over Colossal was, like, any size that was bigger <laughs> than 5x5. Five five. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's why I was just, like asteroid you know <laughs> right you're that, fighting the naval storm you're fighting the moon the we moon did is a, beyond colossal we we did a a, a play test for the tomo beast 2 that's coming out here soon for um or maybe, maybe this was creature codex sorry it's one of those two from uh cobalt press <clears throat> other people uh and there's a mountain giant and we're not talking about like you know, hill giant. yeah, like hill giants, people that are named after something close to their, you know, whatever. These are literally mountains, mountains. that are, you know, like giant. So, I mean, there was no <laughs> reference to how large this thing was other than yeah. it like towers over everything. Yeah, I have it's gargantuan one. <laughs> I have one colossal miniature. I've got the Ashardalon, you know, the big red dragon. Yeah. And so every miniature, I think the gargantuans, if you look at the base, you know, whether it's circular or, or square, or whatever, yeah. it's, it's, um, it's huge as three by three, the gargantuans four by four. All right. A Shardalon is uh, five by five, the big red dragon. Um, so it, my, my, it's my thing is colossal is five by five or anything up. Yeah. Yeah. And just like tiny, which used to be, what is it? It, it was like fine, diminutive. Dim diminutive, yeah. And fine. Tiny. Yeah. And they got rid of fine. And diminutive, and yeah. Diminutive, diminutive, both of them. So you have like everything below, tiny. Is just tiny now, right? It's just, it's just what. But I still like diminutive because it's like, I'm sorry, like a bee is smaller than a fucking house cat, and a house right. cat's supposed to be tiny, and a virus. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> I still like diminutive and or tiny or or fine just to be like indicate. I think what they did, they did the reason they did that, even though the swarms say that it's like a medium swarm of tiny creatures, they essentially were like, we're, we're tired of having so many delineations and we're not going to have a bee attack you. We're going to have a swarm of bees <laughs> attack you. So we're getting yeah. rid of diminutive and, and fine. So well, how do you calculate armor class for a virus anyway? Right. <laughs> we could use that so right now, that information. Yes, we could. <laughs> COVID is d fine. Right. Fine. No, COVID is not fine. COVID and it is societally anyway, evil. You're way no one can can argue against it's that. It's, it's neutral. True neutral. That, that's no, that's completely fair. That's completely <laughs> fair. No <laughs> okay. It doesn't care who it fucks up. All right. So, <laughs> so Thule Cause anyway, came out, so, did his thing. Did his thing, and and apparently and, and the, the lower there's a lot of implications he hung out in the Euphrates Desert. Um, it certainly he was there during the Divine War. Whether I don't think he was there for thousands of years. Clearly he mucked about in other places, but when he spent a lot of time here, um, and how did he? I think he's like the kind of Titan who would go underground and travel underground and stuff. But but he can totally make volcanoes and whatnot, and is almost clearly responsible for the volcano that's hollow faust and the volcano that made Lochiel, and just the fact that there's a bunch of volcano-looking things in this whole region, um, right next to you, Cruden, just throwing a temper tantrum, or just being bored. So amongst all these things, he made a servitor race to fight for him during the war, and I don't know if he made them before the war, but he certainly made them by the war, which is the Sutek. And traditionally, when you think of horse people and high fantasy, you think of centaurs, which are, you know, the Greek. Well, finding a horse of a dude, not right. a horse, like a guy riding a horse, but sort of forward without the... Yeah. And, but instead of the traditional centaur people, he was just like, I'm going to take a horse and I'm going to smoosh them and make them look more like a person with sort of horsey legs right. and face of a horse and... the. And so we did this. Um, so they only have two legs, not four. And do they have tails? They do not. I 
do subtract me. Two tech do not have horse tails. That's disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> I am disappointed. I mean, in a world of other, we're going to call them furry races, <laughs> that have tails, the doing the, 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 the design to get pants is not that hard. There are plenty of other races already doing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The Saloon of Tails, the Manticore of Tails. I'm disappointed that the horse people don't have tails. <laughs> so, anyway, so they made the suit attack, and they were just supposed to be, I will fight for you yeah. during the war. And, and so, and I, I don't think they were made really before. I, didn't, I have to check the suit attack lore, but um, I, think I was doing all this research in the Iron Bread lore, not the suit attack, but. Um, but they certainly were were fighting for him, and that was pretty much their job until he was defeated and sent to go live on the sun. I guess this panel made him into an arrow and shot him in the sun. And he loves it in the sun, and he doesn't want to leave, but he's still pissed off. But anyway, he left all these horse people behind, and their guy who made them and their purpose in life went away. So a bunch of them are still like, yes, we still love Phil Cossum, he's the bomb, and we want him to come back, and... And they still worship him and do all the things. But then a bunch of them were like, a bunch of their kids were like, why are we doing this again? Yeah. <laughs> There's all these other people around that are kind of nice. Have you met these Hollow Legionnaires? They're quite, quite pleasant. <laughs> um, There's these really cool orcs that we met. And they sort of split it off. And it's like, we, we don't want to follow this fire titan who doesn't give a shit about us. Um, we want to go our own way. So they became a redeemed of people and there's not a lot of them i mean the sutak themselves aren't really high in numbers they were just like your standard monster race um and and a la i think monster race like i'm trying to think of an equivalent um and you know kind of D D lore like gnolls or something not not like goblins which seem to be freaking everywhere but but more kind of a smaller so they already have a pretty small population Philcost didn't make a lot of them. So the the Iron Bread, which is the what the Splinter Group call themselves. Yeah. I don't know why they call themselves Iron Bread. I don't know where that name originated, but um, maybe the Iron Philcost Iron. But um, so I guess it's. It does say in the original Sutak entry that the uh, the Sutak were pretty much wiped out during the final years of the Titans War. Yeah. So, so not only are there were there not a lot of them to begin with. But they were almost wiped out, and then so this, the Iron Bread first started as a very small group. <laughs> very small. Group. Right. So I can, like, hundred people. There's they're not they're not a big big group. So if you're playing an Iron Bread, there's not a lot of you. Yeah. So you're not gonna you know, and they basically have one location. Like I didn't want to call it a city. I mean, you you technically call it a city in in that sense. But um, it's certainly not any bigger than Leone, and it doesn't have a big frickin' library or <laughs> or zoo. Sorry, menagerie. What do we call it? Anyway, um, doesn't have that. Uh, so it's small, and it's cool because it's mobile. Um, the as with horses that are, you know, as with wild horses that tend to be um, migratory, um, these the iron bread having city which is pretty cool it's 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 a city that a city so don't think like little village but like you know in in that regard their their population is they've they've put a lot of effort into making more babies yeah their population is a lot lot larger and several thousand people and they can just pick it up and move on a few hours notice yeah it's like whoop we're on you know which is nuts <laughs> But they're incredibly organized. So, I know culturally, I think of them. I don't know if they're lawful good or not, but they kind of fit that um, because they don't put a a culture on it. Um, and I can tell you for sure, they're not all good. They are a wide range of alignment. Yeah. But but they definitely have that kind of incredibly organized um, culture in terms of like this is how we do things. Um, and their leader is is lawful neutral actually, so they do have that kind of lawful vibe. Um, but but their uh, their their groups are a wide variety of alignments. So you can 
can be like pretty much any alignment. It can be evil. You can be, you know, your chaotic evil would be the only thing that really wouldn't matter. Yeah. Because I think those two tack were chaotic evil. So there. if you're chaotic evil, you're probably the moments. Yeah. <laughs> that tracks. <laughs> that tracks. Yeah. <laughs> but but any lawful evil to chaotic good, anything in that span, if we want to go there. Um, so they so they created this city that's so I don't want to say it's a tent city, but it is a yurt city. Yeah. <laughs> so step above that. Um, and they can just sort of pluck it down and pick it up and carry it on their backs. Do iron bread have horses? <laughs> that is a really good question. It does mention that like the yurts are made from the uh, the felt of sheep, camels, and goats. So I'm assuming they have camels as far as pack animals. Which makes sense in the desert. Yeah. yeah. And they do it. There's mention of donkeys as well in another, another place. Gotcha. So I'm just trying to envision horse people with horses yeah <laughs> i still really uh, love do they the think idea. of them as like like us and chimpanzees sort of a distant cousin i <laughs> right early <laughs> early on in travis's scarlands game on monday when it was uh myths and match myths and matchmakers we were really trying to get him to allow us to have a centaur character so we could have an iron bread character riding the centaur character into battle because why not <laughs> <laughs> I want to note this though because there is some confusion iron bread according to the SLPG size are about the size of humans maybe just a wee bit bigger but right. not they're not seven feet tall they're right. like their average height is just slightly bigger than humans so like six four you know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're not we're not talking I mean, yes, there could be a seven foot tall iron bread because there could be a seven foot tall human, but they those would be outside the norm and right. way above average. So their their average height is it's, yeah, I think average human height is like five eight or something. So I think iron bread average height is probably around six feet. But so they're they're a little bit bigger than humans, but yeah. not on a massive you know scale like the like the the um, scrag right. average height is seven feet. So yeah. Yeah, that was a uh, the scrag had to be toned down because you can't have large player characters. Yeah. Even <laughs> even though sea trolls are large, these are like yeah. reduced sea trolls because well, they've, they've fallen out of their... favor with their god or something. I don't know. With the um, the what the the mountain, mm -hmm. the half not half giants but giantish. Oh, Goliath. Um, Goliaths, yeah. So Goliaths are what I, I... I came up with the size category called medium-large. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> They're technically medium in that sense, but they have some attributes of being large. The, uh, the Goliaths, I played one. A Goliath, I played a Goliath fighter. So classic. Um, uh, Surprising. Yes. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, so think about... I have played every class, I think. I have officially just recently finally played every class because I tend to gravitate towards certain styles and paladins are not my style, but I was like, I'm making a paladin and I'm going to do it. So yeah. I haven't played every class in fifth edition, but if you count three, five and all the others. I don't know if that's possible. possible with all of the OGL stuff out there. <laughs> You'd have to have a pretty big class. You could say official. I haven't played an artifice yet. <gasps> yeah, they're, they're officially coming out in November. So... We'll have to make that happen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so Iron Bread. We're <laughs> right. I love the way we just completely go off topic for like 20 minutes. Um, our, our, our viewers do not. Um, right. Uh, so, so they're mobile. Um, and they, they built this city very modularly and very like this is how we build it every time so we can find everything. So they kind of they pick up, they move, they do their thing. And when they pick up and move, they don't necessarily stay together. The, the city's built in uh, five parts, five sections. There's the central hub, which is their um, resplendent general. They're basically their leader. Their home is in the hub, and they kind of manage things in the hub. Um, the resplendent general, Hwai To? H W A I dash T O. Yeah, I think I said Hawaii. I keep saying Hawaii too because T O is two, but it might be To. Two. I I don't know. You know I can't pronounce shit. Um, 
<laughs> um, so, but he's the leader. Yeah. Um, it's all and... neutral. They've got his, this, this, oh, we're, we're using the new book. You know, this is all this material that we're talking about. Not all of it, but a lot of material we're talking yeah. about today comes from, um, we should have started with that. It comes from the brand new book that just came out two days ago. And I just shared uh, the link on Twitch too. Yeah. And Visual Watch, Far 4, The Iron Court, which is why we reserve today to talk about this it's a brand new book. Um, I miss some cool people. Uh, is my name in the credits? Maybe no. I I didn't do any writing on this, so um, I'm just giving thanks. So, so he's the he's the leader. There's a there's a this book has uh, stats for him. Yeah. I think he's the only um, named character. That's not an NPC out. named character who's got a full. Yeah. Stat. I like he has a he has this quote at the very beginning where it starts talking about the Iron Court, and I just said court instead of court <laughs> like <laughs> I think you're measuring out anyway that's fine uh and and I feel like this this quote really kind of emphasizes why he's the leader Harkin Thokla's father of fire and angry earth made us molded us in his molten hands we must seem we must be seen to fight the titan spawn which they technically are twice as hard as the others and so we will fight thrice as hard our father and all of his kind will despair the day he ever put fire into our blood that's yeah. awesome it like it actually gives me like goosebumps because he is just yeah. like he's like the man he is the man. i Although, get goosebumps too that that might just because a breeze just went through the <laughs> <laughs> or your terrible voice jeremy jeez <laughs> But yeah, he's definitely like he's he's actually um, the reason that the, this whole like concept of um, the Iron Bread being a great example of of taking a evil race and making them good because he's yeah. not only good, I think so he's the lawful good, correct? Lawful neutral. Lawful neutral. So he's. he's I thought not he was lawful evil. good. I thought yeah. they were lawful good this whole time. And I'm just yeah. Like, oh, and they have been as lawful neutral. That's so it. he's not an yeah. evil character, but he is also no. so dead set against his creation like he is not going to follow in the footsteps that has been laid out for him he is going to stand up against his creator and say i'm going to be my own person what a great example of how to do things and change yeah. the, the course of an entire at least group of a race of people i like and, this guy <laughs> and i think that like as iron bread pcs you know you've either I mean, odds are you came from the Iron Court. Odds are you were born there. Right. Because this is, this is pretty much it for the Iron Bread. Um, how long has the Iron Court been around? Yeah, it's, um, I couldn't find any the, reference stating yeah, exactly. But um, I do really like that... What was I going to say? Crap. Train derailed. Uh, Sorry. Continue. Oh, is, oh, is it going on? I, I, I would, I would guess it's probably not more than a hundred years. If that, that would make sense. Like it um, seems so organized enough to be older than like maybe. a decade or two. Yeah. But. But not like, not like, I don't think I mean, I, they wouldn't have splintered off during the war. Certainly, they wouldn't have splintered off until Thokles was defeated, and then, then I, I'm sure at that point, even then, it took them a while. So I would guess it can't be more than a hundred years old. Um, and but yeah, it definitely has a at least. 20 years vibe yeah um and friends so, points out I, I don't know if you're going to bring this up but i'm just going to mention it before it scrolls off and i forget um are you going to talk about that there are iron bread elsewhere oh yeah yeah okay i, was, I, was I will not bring that, that up it, and are you going to talk it, about their relationships yes yeah, where we started to go. perfect i will not bring is it up that, <laughs> is that we is that this isn't the only place you'd find them so i was saying the origins that the first iron bread would have been in the iron court, which is, which is again, why I'm making the argument that the iron court's got to be more than four years old because you can find iron bread throughout Gelsbad, right. not necessarily off the continent. That referred to so themselves you, as iron bread instead of sea tech. And referred to themselves, yeah. So you're not going to necessarily find them in Tamrana or something like that because that would be weird and rare. Um, like, like, I got finding... on a pirate ship and I made it. Right. But, but you're not going to find a city of iron bread or even like, more than a couple. But... Oh, this um, is the general... only city of the yeah. Iron Bread. Yeah. So if you find them elsewhere, it would be you'd be like first generation. Yeah. So your parents came here from the Iron Court and decided to build a house in Besh. I don't know where. <laughs> or <laughs> um, it would 
it could also be that you were Sutak elsewhere and the story of Iron Bread has reached you and you have also thrown off your chains, yeah. however you want to call okay. it, and and now call yourself Iron Bread. You may not have come from the Iron Court even uh, lineagely wise, but yeah, it has at least been there for a few decades. Yeah, and and but I would say the vast majority, like ninety five percent of the Iron Bread, would be in Western Gelsbad, totally. not even in Gelsbad, but in Western Gelsbad. Totally. So, so shells are up to Derekine. I feel like there's a couple of references in um, of yeah. Sutak in the. Uh, the Lydian planes, oh, the planes, planes of Lydian, yeah, right? Yeah, you're right. You're right. Um, but so those are Shutak. So those I mean, so if you wanted to play it, I am a mithril knight, ironbred, whose parents were Sutak. Right, could totally see it. Yeah, <laughs> who had really issues with dad. I, yeah. I and could maybe do that. Yeah, I think yeah. there's definitely some like word no. ambigu- ambiguity that goes on. Sutak yeah. are ironbred. Iron bread Arzutak, but there is a a choice yeah. like a I am calling myself this because I no longer follow Thulkas and yeah. I'm going to be my own person. It, you know, it's just it's it's like the Slytherin really in in that regard Ex- as yeah. redeemed versus right. not redeemed. I mean, we didn't come up with a new name, or we they didn't they, come up with right. a new name for redeemed Slytherin. Yeah, they're still like rat folk, but um, but there's definitely that break of. I'm redeemed. I'm not, you know, a raving monster who wants to right. bring back Mormo or whoever. Um, but and, and it, but the difference between the Slytherin, I think, Excuse and me. the Ironbred is the Slytherin are like were made by all the Titans except maybe Dennis. Um, so they 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 were twelve different branches, um, who some of whom unified, many who didn't, and they can be found all over Galesback. The and beyond iron bread slash yeah and, and well and beyond because they've traveled right um the iron bread haven't were a much smaller population to begin with right so not a lot of them i'd say population wise they're, they're probably fewer than there are, are manticora who there aren't a lot of yeah that tracks especially um, because like the yeah. manticora didn't get slaughtered at the end of the slaughtered <laughs> as much as the uh you know the because yeah. the, the they were on the winning did. side right yeah, because Manticore are not Titan Spawn <laughs> in any way. Beyond the cats they were made from were Titan Spawn. Right. Because everything was Titan Spawn. But, but, um, but uh, Sutak are totally, by every definition, well, not every definition. Well, anyway, Sutak are Titan Spawn. Iron Bread are redeemed. But Titan Spawn. I, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, there, there's again, a societal... again, three definitions of Titan Spawn here. <laughs> right. There's a societal <laughs> definition of Titan Spawn being um, those who are created by Titans, but also were like were and are still followers of the Titans. It's, yeah. Would so, that be fair like, to say? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Sutak are, yeah, it's either made by the Titans, accidentally made by the Titans. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> followers of the titans and and like accidentally made by the titans would be you know the, the slytherin right you know, as an or, or half of the shit in the blood sea anything that um, went up and nommed on a titan and therefore altered into a new completely different creature creature yeah or um it, and it didn't even need to be like they ate it but like essence especially of like it. divine level can seep into yeah. your being in multiple ways. So yeah, yeah. I mean, don't go like jumping into pools of Titan gook. Based on that <laughs> definition, every sorcerer on Sp- Skarn is a Titan spawn. <laughs> right? <laughs> so the whole Titan spawn thing is like a stupid definition. <laughs> and I do find this funny. This is completely off topic, but people are like, damn Titan spawn. I'm going to go practice magic. Well, your you magic came from even wizardry. Like, is like that came from originally, Mesos, um, and was like I don't know. Like sorcery was given by Mesos, but wasn't sure, yeah. wasn't wizardry, wizardry essentially like Mesos exploded? No, and, no, 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 no. no. And Wizards were around it. way before. Gotcha, magic. gotcha. So were yeah, they yeah. around before Mesos's epoch? 
yes. Okay, interesting. Yes. I want to delve more into this for a future episode. But meanwhile, I want to know where wizards came from. <laughs> yeah, a big bunch of people study magic. Um, so I would not What's say wizards magic? are... But in any case, uh, Iron Court. So, mobile, pick up. Yes. Yeah. Um, there's, there's five groups. So we have the center one with resplendent General Watto. And then there's four kind of spoke you know, right at the camera. Okay. <laughs> there's four. It's in your face. <laughs> that, um, that, that like kind of wheel around it, um, yeah. depending on how we're set up and, you know, Lulu's going to go there and Xantha's going to go there. Um, yeah. And so there's, there, they call themselves the elder council. And there's basically four sort of sub lieutenants of the resplendent general. Um, um, and I, I love that kind of there's sort of a color coordination going here too and alignments and everything. So it's it's almost like like sort of that that vibe of of like, okay, if you're if you're lawful and neutral, you work for the general. If you're new if you're chaotic good, you you know yeah. it's that, that vibe. Um, it's almost like, did, did, did they wrap around them the way the planes do? I don't, I don't know here. But I also really appreciate the fact that on, in, in the ruling elder council, this, this group, they're not all good people. Like, no, no. Lieutenant Red Ike Six? Yeah. Ike Six. Ike Six? Evil. Evil. Lawful evil. Yeah. Lawful evil. Lawful evil. You can but work still, with like, the fact that these... This group came together and was like, we don't all agree, but we also need she. to survive. <laughs> yeah, and it's she, she, she Lieutenant yeah. Red Week 6, um, who's a gladiator, and I think that's just sticking an NPC class, you can give her some stats. Um, and she's she's totally got the whole, I'm going to beat everybody up, conquesty y right. thing. Um, not doesn't mean she's a follower of Chardoon or anything like that, it just means she's got that sort of vibe. Um, she in cool so like in terms of a war leader who's kind of evil yeah i love her so uh, she's gonna get the red branch right i love her description um, that says uh, she's known for her frightful crimson war paint and discordant yeah. battle cries described by her enemies as sounding like shark teeth drawn across steel strings and if you ever heard a, a horse scream it is a fucking terrifying sound like yeah all i can imagine is this fairly large like beefy not super tall but beefy horse person coming over this hill making this horrid noise i would run the fuck away <laughs> yeah, yeah. <sighs> then you've got our lieutenant jarvol silverhoof yeah our neutral good you know it's like we've red now he's silver so i'm like there's some there's a vibe they're like dragon colors what are we doing yeah. here <laughs> yeah, i think in the slpg it mentions that a lot of their names have colors in them so like yeah. Braca, who's on the creator acid caches is actually Braca blue um yeah. uh and they i like i feel like this helps explain that some like why yeah. why these colors are affiliated with their society as opposed to just being like why yeah and i i like i like Jarvel because he, I, I I added I've got I've got an iron bread in um, my little campaign thing um, maritime mission I've got an iron bread uh, pirate no, not really. ship crewman on yeah. my not pirate boat which isn't a pirate which is basically a pirate boat but it's not a pirate boat it's a merchant vessel really <laughs> um, and and he's got a peg leg yeah because I was just like. I like the idea of, you know, a traditional piratey peg leg guy, but he's a horse person. Yeah. And lo and behold, we've got our our Lieutenant Silverhoof has has a artificial leg. So yeah. that's neat. Um, which I'm assuming um, is silver. Which, which I'm assuming is silver, yeah. Or at least silvery. <laughs> like it, it, it could yeah, be steel, but ball. like that like silvery color. Yeah. And he's he's neutral good. So we're, we're kind of continuing around the alignment board. Um, then we've got, uh, Lieutenant Zanta, who's the third lieutenant, um, they, them, Iron Bread Knight, which I think is cool, and we are, we're pushing a lot of non-binary characters. Yeah, in the new and, and if you want to talk about so being we, cool, the fact that they have a, um, 
the word just escaped me. Mm. Um, oh my god. The guy we were just talking about. So, Jarvel. Having, yeah. having, not having uh, both of his legs. Like, go oh, yeah. you. Diver- Great. Adding to some diversity. Having right. somebody who's actually got a... Got a, a so, in your uh, face, people who don't think... You can have. Like, like yeah, it's like why didn't you just why didn't you just you know uh, what's the word um regrow leg right magic. regenerate <laughs> yeah yeah well because fuck you no sorry <laughs> yeah like can you play can you play somebody with a disability and and I think yeah why not yeah, yeah I think that's interesting yeah yeah I play with you know cyberpunk could do it but it's so can D D um so I think I think it's cool. Um, so and we, so we've got our non-binary um, um, lieutenant Xantha. Well, my only my only criticism is that it sounds a little Piers Anthony in my book, but that's okay. Nobody remembers those books anyway. I totally every um, time I see it, I'm just like, Ooh, that's completely never mind. I'm not gonna say it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's you know okay. It's a little heavy on the X there, but um, but interesting character and and associated with dreams. So. I don't know if there's a color associated with them, but I don't know, gray maybe. Um, shadow silent plagues their mind. Xantha dreams of ru- shadows and dreams. <sighs> I had nothing to do with the creation of this character. <laughs> <laughs> and but finally, maybe somebody our, read your book and was just like, maybe it's like, oh, let's throw this. In there. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know who wrote this book. Um, then finally, our fourth uh, spoke um, is not an iron bread. Yeah, I the should have a picture leader, of these people up, actually. Is wow. Mother Lulu, um, who's a druid, orc, um, Urukai, or whatever we pronounce it. Those orcs we talked about last last week who live in the Scar. I'm glad we talked about those last week. Um, <laughs> so those those really groovy hippie orcs who like farm in the middle of this. Grand Canyon looking thing. Um, one of them, they're they're kind of this obvious alliance with the Iron Bread, um, since they're orcs who have an innate resistance to heat, um, and the Iron Bread have an innate resistance to heat. Um, they're both desert, so they're both desert dwelling races um, that they would be allies. And to the point where um, you can find some of these orcs amongst the Iron Bread, um, these redeemed orcs. I didn't even know. Can you, yeah, I guess we still refer to them as redeemed orc. Um, so we have Mother Lulu, who's a orc druid, who's one of their leaders, who's, who's on their, their council. So it's great. It, with this picture of the council, and I, I remember seeing the picture before I had read the text. And yeah. Going, What's wrong with her with face? green, horse, <laughs> squishy face. Right? <laughs> it's like, that's an orc, idiot. <laughs> but, then, but then I went, okay, if she's an Urukai, how come she's green and not black? Yeah, or at least a darker, darker, darker green. <laughs> or really darker green. Yeah. Like, I, I am entertained by her black. face, though, because... Or, or the fact that you have to be like, what's wrong with her face? Because you don't catch that she's an orc because she is so old. <laughs> you have to be like, what? Is she undead? Holy crap. <laughs> she's green like a zombie. Right? <laughs> like, no. She's, a, she's <laughs> what? an old, yeah. old orc. Is that, a, is that an iron bread... Colloquialism, colloquial. Oh man, my tongue is not. Why the short face? Ah, uh, <laughs> Fran for the I win. Oh, she's middle like Are you insensitive, Gloss? <laughs> it's so true. Oh, God, she's old enough that it could have spread everywhere. It's my mother is middle like and she's as white as a. She doesn't have any more spots. She's as white as a sheet, um, everywhere. <laughs> so, so yeah, I, I get that does, yeah, because originally it spots, but like the whole, your whole, everywhere can get bleached out. Yeah, that's what happened to my mom. So yes, yeah, so maybe she's, she's supposed to be really old, so maybe she's been like, I don't know. Uh, uh, sure, we'll go with that. Um, but what I love about, well, I love many things about my mother. I think she's a straight character. <laughs> she's she's chaotic neutral, which like. I I have, I have, I, have, I I adore chaotic good and chaotic neutral characters, um, but I love my favorite part of her description is that she not in this description but 
elsewhere in the book, she talks about her um, using, uh, when they decide where they're going to go or when they're going to move, they do divination magic. And she's one of their most powerful spellcasters. Yeah. So they, but they, but they do kind of druidic kind of, kind of ceremonies for this. So we're, they're not like, you know, I, I, you know, the, the traditional wizard divination where they're like, I cast the dice or whatever. She's, she's the reading the entrails kind of <laughs> divination. <laughs> and, and they said, and I love this. I want to find the, the actual description here. Um, I can't, I, I read it earlier and I can't remember where, where in this it was, but they said that she reads it through the reading the head of a donkey. And I was like, they're horse people. <laughs> that seems kind of wrong. <laughs> yeah. Going back to the whole thing about their, their yurts being, you know, hides of, you know, these other creatures. And we've often had this uh, conversation in game when there's iron bread involved. Are iron bread carnivores or omnivores? And do they eat horse if needed? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, or <laughs> are they eating these the rest of these creatures? Who knows? Cause, yeah, I mean, cause I, horses I, I, I themselves can tell you. Are, are... If I'm playing a Slytherin, I will not eat rat. I can tell you that. <laughs> But I could, see, I could see, I could see a lot of Slytherin, especially de like certain. Um, of well, the... like brown gorger, sure. Absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but if, unless I'm playing, I'm not gonna. Unless I'm playing a brown brown gorger, I'm I'm not gonna eat a rat if I'm playing a Slytherin because there's just something wrong with that. <laughs> but I mean, it's just me. I don't know. Um, but anyway, so so apparently she reads divination through through somehow through donkey heads. I'm trying to find the quote. I can't find the quote. But um, I just, it hit me, and I was just like, that is, that is cool, but messed up. <laughs> I love it, though. I absolutely love it. Um, so, yeah. Um, and they're, they're... Here it is. Religious Mother, what? Yeah. Mother Lulu herself commands much fame for her ability at cephalonomancy, divination there, via boiling a donkey's head. Yeah, there you found it. You found the quote. Okay. <laughs> So it was like, okay, that's that's horrible and awesome at the same time. <laughs> so so basically, that they have these five groups, um, and I don't know what colors are associated with the three. So two of my colors. Um, I'm I'm gonna just picture white and yellow for the other two. I don't know why. Um, uh, but so that they pick up, they they leave, they go off, and what they can do is they can be like, okay, we're gonna meet hereish. And they can actually run off in five different groups. And as a as a smaller unit, be like, we're just going to make a mini iron court with just our group um, as needed, and then we'll meet up later. And, and and I'm sure they use various means of contacting each other. They've got enough magic and whatnot. It's like sending spell. Okay, we're over by this mountain, <laughs> you know, whatever. Um, to check out this sand dune, you know, and, and birds and whatever to, to talk to each other because I didn't get into that in Vigilant. Um, very much how you talk very to each much. other. Very much. Um, how you talk to each other when you're spread out. Um, so they would they would split up and be like, okay, we're going to go. And, and, and when they move the city, it's for a variety of reasons. You know, maybe there's a windstorm coming. Maybe there's a herd of some kind of animal that they're following. And again, you're that, are they omnivores or... I, I, they got to be omnivores because they talk about that. They talk about them hunting. So yeah, I'm, I'm assuming. Herbivores don't, I'm assu assuming. And if they're herbivores, they'd be farmers, not nomads. So I'm guessing they've got to be. Um, and so they would do do that and split up. And that's kind of like how their culture is always on the move and they're always on the alert and they they've always have scouts and diviners and all this stuff checking out what's happening all the time because yeah. they are kind of in that vibe of always having to move or, or for whatever reason a band of suit attack are coming whatever the reason yeah. is they they think along that defensively and they I, also think very militarily and very strategically yeah and i think a lot of that is because of resplendent general hua too because yeah. he he is the reason that this is the case but he wants all of the spokes all of those different sides to be completely self-sufficient 
but also be a unit. They are yeah. part of the whole, but they have to be able to take care of themselves. Because if Sutak come in and attack, or a giant fucking sand monster thing rolls over, they have to be able to take care of themselves. Mm-hmm. Get and the they... kids away from the purple worm. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Because you never know. Like, oh crap, we just put our city on top of a beggar nest. No. <laughs> or or Vengarak or something. So, Yeah. I think I think Fran's gonna bust if we don't talk about their relationships. Uh, is... I'm gonna get there. I'm gonna. I'm trying to go through this strategically. <laughs> so we talked I've, I've, the name and then the thing. I, I've got an order to this, darling. Um, Fran's my wife. This is not a secret. Okay. So first, off, I want to talk about how how when they broke off. Um, one of the things they do is they give themselves their names. I know this feels so trans to me. Like, like, like I found myself, and I'm choosing a new name. Um, maybe some interesting folks are on this project. I don't know, but um, it just feels very trans decision to me. Is when they were so when the Sutak renounces Stulkos and says, "Screw it, I'm going to go join the Iron Bread," and, and they ch- get to choose a new name because their yeah. Sutak name is considered like Stulkosian or whatever. Right. And so, and as they and even people born in the Iron Bread, as they kind of mature and get to the age of, you know, maturity, they get to choose their name. And I think that's that's pretty neat. Um, so I think Lulu is probably the only one who didn't go through this. <laughs> um, so I think that's I think that's a cool cultural thing. Um, but another thing about their culture that someone was just alluding to is because their population is so tiny that they don't have this concept of monogamy because they have to make the babies yeah. and they have to be as diverse about it as possible. Yeah. So they are naturally, I guess, or culturally polyamorous. Yeah. I would say even naturally because horses, if they were elevated from horses, horses don't go get married. You know what I mean? Yeah, I feel like there's life. a certain instinctual level that they just yeah. aren't subscribing yeah. to a human <laughs> concept or even, you know, like other humanoids concepts of, of marriage and monogamy and having children with only one other. I feel like it's both needed. Like they have to populate and there's just a certain instinct of why. (laughs) Yeah. So, so they are by default polyamorous, which I think is, I think it's kind of awesome. Yeah. That's like, it makes them a little different than any of the other, because we talked about a little bit how the Manticore also small population need to make babies, but they're more lion-y, you know, they do wed, they do, you know, not so many for life, but certainly mate long term, but they All have right. litters of kids and just tend to try, to try to have a lot of kids. Iron bread, they don't have litters, they, you know, horses don't have multiples right. generally. Um, and, but they are like, going to be with you this year we're going to be with you next year and we're going to and we're going to have a big family and we're all going to take care of each other's kids in kind of a communal way yeah and i think that's by all like, frankly i think that's beautiful and i think it's awesome um i think it's awesome to see just, in an official yeah. capacity for a, a setting rather than yeah. you know yeah. like a lot of what's going on um for official D D are people that are on the outer edges that are trying to be yeah. included. And We've... they, I mean, why not? Why not include things officially? <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> well, let's say, I mean, I've talked, I've talked about this like for years at conventions or whatnot, how we, those of us who, who fit kind of more on the edge of, is it even the edge anymore? I don't even know anymore. But certainly back when I was growing up in the 80s and 90s, it was. Um, those of us who weren't like fitting the norm, whether right. we were nerdy or, or, or LGBT or whatever, um, whatever our, our thing was, we found our outlet and fan sci-fi and fantasy because it was more acceptable in sci-fi and fantasy. First, yeah. The first gay characters you find in media are in sci-fi fantasy, generally. Or, or mocked in a sitcom um and and that's been the case of you know any kind of a group that stands outside 
and so we've always done that in D and D as part of D and D. It's like there've always been that thing, but to make it more official is rarer. Yeah. Um. I so I know we've been pushing a lot of of diversity in Scarlands, new Scarlands stuff, um, as we can. And again, just a freelance writer. I'm not official, and I don't know what the official people. With that do. being said, <laughs> that being said, the person who is the uh, the official design lead, yeah, is all about Alex. it, and he. I feel like he is also part of the push. Yes, he's definitely part of the push. So we're, we are. There's definitely a lot of a lot more diversity happening in in this, and we did it before Watsy. Um, <laughs> we, <laughs> well, I feel like they're just catching up now. Yeah, I know. I have I have my own issues with Watsy. We talked about that before, and they can. You know, and I'm I'm going to throw this out there because yeah. I think it's fair. Um, Watsi is a behemoth, and behemoths yeah. tend to move slower. Like the the gears that need to turn. You're. I'm not hearing you unless you're just mouthing things. I'm just saying they're not that big. I've been there. They're not. Uh, yeah. I mean, they're a behemoth because they have a lot of freelancers. They have a lot of right. But the core Watsi. They also have. So, because like Watsi is not like Onyx Path, where they are their own thing anymore. No, 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 no. Oh, that's true. That's true. That's true. Onyx Path is like that, twelve people, right? Yeah. Like, and yeah. Hasbro stands over and that's says, true. "No, don't do that." Um, yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. I They're feel like, holding the Hasbro. Yeah, there's definitely a slower process when it comes yeah. to change, and that's yeah, yeah. that's sad, and yeah. it definitely in in today's environment, today's climate, people want change and they want it fucking yesterday, and I don't blame them. And groups like like Onyx Path are great because they are small enough to be able to go. All right, let's let's change this. We're just gonna. Yeah, like I wasn't thinking say, about the Hasbro element, but yeah. you're right. You're right. When when you're because Onyx Path is involved in really. I mean, they they've got their kind of licensed stuff, right? But they're not beholden the way Watsi is to Hasbro. Right. Where they're 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 a small division of a really. I mean, it was, and remember it was. TSR got eight by Watsi got eight by it has Hasbro, been, right. so it wasn't even, you know, it's an even longer line than that. Yeah, because originally it was just TSR. There are many times I I wonder if TSR had survived on its own, what would it be like today? Would it be quicker to change and to accept these things that should tradition. be, or would it just be? I mean. <laughs> You also have yeah. to think about the originators of TSR, probably not the most open-minded fellows. Well, it was in the... Right. I don't know. I didn't want to I didn't want to conjecture, but it was a bunch of white guys in the 70s. Right. So, <laughs> I don't want to conjecture. But, but yeah, I've, I've been to Watsi HQ, and it's, it's, it's cool. I won't, won't argue that, but it's not like... It's, it's not a massive... You know, right. behemoth. The, the, their age, it's not bad. Yeah, I, I call it a mid-sized company, um, but I, I totally forgot about Hasbro. Yeah, but yeah, and that is a behemoth. <laughs> we are beholden for this. We're in Seattle, and we're beholden to this company in Rhode Island or whatever. Right, they, wherever they are. right. <laughs> Anytime you add that extra layer above you, it just slows. Yeah, slows yeah, progress totally slows down. The machine down. Totally gets slows the machine. So anyway, uh, we were way off in the weeds again. So, so we've added, we've got polyamorous horse people. Yep. We've got non-binary horse people. Um, it's kind of cool. I love it. Um, so I talked about culture. Uh, uh, as with all of, <laughs> just nearly every race on Scar, um, tattoos. Yeah. Big deal. Big big deal for them. Yeah. Big big deal. I, I again they have fur so i don't know how that works yeah when you look at the art like they seem furless but i don't think they are i feel like those they they do very wide tattoos that kind of um come through like horse hair is not super long yeah and so Except on the mane and the right tail. um i don't think the art is completely realistic to what it would look like but i mean how could you make it any better? I think the art is great, and I, I, it does the best that it can. <laughs> so they have 
they have a lot of tattoos. They um, use a lot of natural things in their in their art and in their um, crafting. So um, leather and hemp and uh, feathers and things that are like more found. I don't, you know, where they would find in nature more than like, and if you have, were in a permanent city and you could mine and, and have farms and stuff. So very nomadic kind of stuff that they've gathered, um, which I think is really cool. Uh, but they do do some, they do have some very mobile industry, like obviously they, they do drying hides and they do leather work and they do tanning and they do dyeing, things like that. So they had to have a sense of industry, just an industry that's easy to pick up and move. Yeah. So, um, uh, and there's another little so that, like, like bit of, um, society or culture that I thought was really interesting. And the first thing that comes to my mind when I think about it is Islam, but like the yurt's entrance always faces South. Like they have yeah. this, like, and it doesn't say why or like what part of their belief system made it so, but like just these little nuggets of information I think are so interesting that they included in this new, this new book. And it might, might just be as simple as if we all face the same direction, it's easy to find the entrance to the yurt and we're not facing entrance to entrance where it might get awkward. Right. I don't know. It like, might be see, something as a practical reason. Yeah. If I were designing it, my first thing would have been like, they all face inward on their spoke. But then you might run into the, you know, toward the spoke, like, and how does it work in the middle? And, um, I, I don't know. To me, it's, to me, it's, it feels like, and I, maybe I'm just thinking from yeah. the way, but, but it's like, because when they pick up and move and resettle, they have to kind of follow the same structure because they they don't have one person going, okay, you go there and you go yeah. there. It's like, yeah. everybody knows what to do because they've done it so many times. And so they have a system. Yeah. So it's like, okay, I know that my tent goes next to Bob's tent, but I don't have to think beyond that. Right. And of my yurt or my whatever it is I'm building, my blacksmith shop, because I assume there's stuff like that. Um, and so I, I it's so to, to direct it based on the cardinal, you know, there's the sun and all that. Yeah. Like, okay, I go here and then boof, and then the faces. It's just easy to construct it without having to go and to your leader and go, am I supposed yeah. to go this way? That totally makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want the paddock over there? It's like a cultural <laughs> go, thing no, that rose yeah. from convenience. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's why they, they do it. And every, their culture is all centered around this concept of the wheel, mm -hmm. the great, they call it the, the great, great wheel. wheel right. Um, and the city is shaped in a wheel with these four spokes. So it's very, um, circles are, Clearly important to them. Um, I, I I just imagine they have a lot of wagons because of the mobility um, and some kind of camels. I don't know what. Yeah. So it talks about like their modular structure and everything, and it just says that um, the the tents are assembled from rods covered in the, the the skins, and the whole structure packs down into a small bundle for migration. So either they're carrying it on their backs or on their animal you know, their, whatever their pack animal is, but things like, um, the blacksmiths and like anvils yeah. and stuff, they're not going to be able to carry that. Your camel is not going to carry that for however many miles. So they have yeah, to have yeah. at least some kind of wagon convoy going on. Yeah. Yeah. Something like that. So I don't know, but it sounds cool. And obviously they do. Um, I think it's apparent they do. They, because it, and this is this is one of those confusing things with our scarred lands that I want to clarify. Um, Thulkos is associated with the forge, even though he's not the titan of the forge. And right. I want to want to make this clear because that's Golthaga, different other titan. <laughs> but there's still that in 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 that fantasy culture. You know, whenever you're talking about this kind of thing, blacksmiths are like when you like, when I set up the village in my new fantasy game. You know, first you have the inn, right? Then you have the blacksmith. You know, it's like the second thing. <laughs> Maybe the inn, the magic shop, the blacksmith. But there's always a blacksmith. There's always some kind of forge right. thing happening. Um, so, and I think the fact that two titans and at least one god are associated with forging and and that is fine. 
Thulkas is more, I like the forge, and Golthaga is more as, this is what you do with the tongues and the hammer. Um, <laughs> but, but there is that uh, talk about um, the forge a lot still with the iron court and, and all of that thing. Um, and they literally use enterprising characters. Characters can set the tone, make deep impressions, and forge the developing culture of the Iron Thread. <laughs> okay. Next point, though. The class is not. Um, <laughs> but I can't. I can't imagine these guys without without that. And they do talk right. about metal working to a to a limited degree, at least. Anyway, I'm going way off in the weeds, and that was a lot for basically four pages. Yeah. That's. Not a lot here. There is one cool. little other thing on here that I noticed while we, while we've been chatting that goes back to do they have horses? So, they have horses? Uh, the roving city state comprises a patchwork collection of covered wagons, war chariots, and other mobile structures. War chariots, eh? I don't think camels it's... are pulling those their war chariots. Big goats. I don't know. Big Some goats. kind of desert animal. And I'm going to throw this out there because. I don't know if this is well-known information. I feel like it's not, but Travis Legg, who is the, the lead design on uh, Scarred Lands for uh, Onyx Path, he's releasing these these bits of information out into the world with the hopes that you will pick them up and go make stuff, stuff. that makes sense for it. Like, are these... Like, what... What new creature can you come up with that is yeah. the war chariot pulling beast of burden or war animal for these guys? Like, they're in the desert. I would go giant lizard all the way, but Yeah, maybe that's they've mean. got a six-legged bear oh. dragging their cart. Would that be awesome? <laughs> that <would be> awesome. <laughs> or, or, or one of those land sharks. What are they called? Um, Bullets. Uh, bullet. bullet. Yeah. yeah. That would be cool. Like a tame bullet. Right. Somehow. Totally. That isn't digging underground, you know. Um, I don't think they'd have a Venger Act, but but yeah, I think that would be neat if if it was something that's so. Yeah, you know, as long as it's deserty, yeah, it doesn't matter. So I, I I, and and yeah, this a lot of this is to see people's ideas to write for the Slurrasian Vault because right. you know that's where, our, you know, yes, Slurrasian Vault stuff isn't necessarily canon, but um, it is an official. <laughs> but notice I'm using air quotes so right. and it's mostly not canon just because people writing for the vault don't know what else is coming out and to try to wrangle it all for consistency is, is probably impossible but it is a very difficult class and it would be very expensive to do so we can't we can't like put a rubber stamp on everything that anyone ever comes out with but so it can't be canon for that reason because we might contradict something that was written on the vault later. Right. I don't mean, and by we, I mean they, not we. You know what I mean. <laughs> like, Vigilant is canon, but I guarantee, I guarantee something official Scarred Lands is going to contradict some shit. Oh, yeah. Vigilant. Well, I mean, official Scarred Lands <laughs> stuff contradicts guarantee. itself all the time anyway, so. All the time. <laughs> I'm, 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 in fact, I am 100% sure it's already happened. Um, so. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. It's already happened. So, so that's why I put can it because half the stuff on the vault could easily fit in in, that, in this very fuzzy, contradicting universe. Because honestly, when you're running D&D, everybody's vision of everybody's game is a little different. And you could play in four different games of Curse of Strahd and they are all different. Guarantee you. Totally. I've seen three different games of Curse of Strahd, and I was like, this is the same game? Yeah. Okay, the NPCs have the same names. Kind of. <laughs> is it Veliki or Velaki? I don't even know. Everybody <laughs> does it differently. <laughs> yes, I'm playing Curse of Strahd tomorrow. Why do you ask? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> We've been playing it for a century. Um, so... So yeah, it's always going to be a different interpretation anyway. Yeah. So call it, calling it canon is like fuzzy because it's so fuzzy. So what the hell is canon in Forgotten Realms? I don't know. So, any hoot. Moving on. So that was like about half the book is is the Iron Court and the Iron Bread and all of that business. The other half of the book 
is the rest of kind of the, 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 the substance around that, which is the, the, the dangers of the region. Yeah. And, which um, isn't a pleasant place to live. Which isn't a pleasant place to live. And, and also the, uh, both the talking more about the Sutak and talking more about, um, I just realized something. They're not in the Akrudin. The Iron Court is not in the Akrudin. Oh, really? It's in the Sweltering Plains. It's in the Sweltering Plains. Well, there I go, having the wrong spot of the map. Uh, no, I thought it was the Akrudin this whole flipping time. Until I just read, in this book, a reference to that. So instead of Where up here... Where the hell is it? Okay, I'm going to triple check it's this. It's down here. Is it down in the... Because the next section of the book talks about the dangers of the sweltering plains, huh. not the dangers of the curtain. But the Sutak did rise, or or were <laughs> mostly manifest in the Akrudin. And so, actually, that makes sense. So, uh, but that explains why they're allied with those orcs. Yeah. Not only, not only are they allied, <laughs> not only are they allied with those orcs, but like, okay, so going up here to the Akrudin. Um, Sutak country. Bats. No, 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 I, I, I... Coming down here. Sutak came from the Akrudin, confirmed. I'm reading that and I'm, I'm checking if there's yeah. a door in here. So that totally makes sense that the the Ironbred were like, all right, we're GTFOing. Let's go down here to that? this fabulously Thank named you. oasis called the Sweltering Plains. That sounds like a great place to live. <laughs> <laughs> but it's got to be better than you know up here with all of these Sutak. I don't know. I don't know. I, 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 and I'm I'm actually I I'm not a hundred percent sure now because all I all I know is that on page eight of this book it says the dangers of the sweltering plains and I'm like, does that mean the Iron Court is in the sweltering plains and not the Akruta? That's the only reason I ask. Yeah. Because like, why are we suddenly talking about the sweltering plains, which is nearby, kind of? I mean, you've got a festering field full of undead in the middle. <laughs> so or you went this way I guess could have gone that way around the festering field I, I festering fields I don't know but but uh, but I would also say as this region goes everything south of Derekin the sweltering plains is the least bad that isn't right on the coast <laughs> right is the least bad. It does, you you got to get to the mountains of man before you run into undead. You know, it's 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 just it's I would not call that titan scarred lands, the sweltering plains. It's just hot <laughs> and yeah, Mojave, but without you know so much the monsters. Um, it's not it's not monster ridden like to the level I oh. should say of the blood steps or the devil's march or any of those other areas. I did oh, just find just... A, another entry. Hmm? The Iron Bread can appear with lightning barrages of arrows from horseback. They do ride horses. Horses ride horses! <laughs> I like how this has been the ongoing question throughout the episode. Because <laughs> we so did our research. Look, this book came out two days ago. We're doing right. this. <laughs> right. And I read it this morning. And by reading, I meant skim through it. But a lot I, I of the information day, was, but... yeah, like, like a lot of the new information um, really stands out as opposed to the older stuff from the SLPG and stuff, yeah. such. Yeah. yeah. So so the next section of the book talks about a little bit more about the Sutak, just in, so, in terms of, like, here's, 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 you know, the enemy of the Iron Bread, so to speak, and also kind of the, 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 the bad guys that they're based on. Um, and, and some of the cool things they can do. And there's a couple of cool uh, Sutak NPCs that you can use. Um, so we'll, we'll, what are they called? N well, anyway, named NPCs based on a creature type. NPCs, blah, blah. yeah. Uh-oh, are you frozen? You look, oh, and there she goes. Um, yeah, so it is. It, it, we're going. I'll go back to the uh, while she's gone. I'll go back to the uh, contradicting itself. There is a lot of uh, information in the in in the official Scarland stuff that contradicts itself. And dangers of the sweltering plane straight up says that Sutek bans are an issue. Um, there she is. Maybe. 
Hi. Sorry about that. This no, no. Is dumb. It crashed on me again. Um, I was just talking about how there are those contradictions within even official yeah. stuff, and like it's talking about Sutak bands in in the sweltering plains, uh, even though they are from the Akruden. Like, the Akruden. and it, it makes sense. It's not that far from the Akruden to the sweltering plains, and if you wanted to, if you were domineering, because they are, they are like. Well, it, it, it makes sense dominating. to me. That's why I was thinking the Iron Court was probably in the Sweltering Plains yeah. because that's why they're talking about the Sutak of the Sweltering Plains, right. even though they're also found in the Akruden. Hope that wasn't too loud. Whatever is happening behind me. I heard it, but it wasn't too loud. Okay, good. Good. There's some kind of thing. Yeah, they came to rampage. Absolutely. Next yeah. door neighbor's yard. Fun. Um, yeah. Um. So anyway, you, we've got two new NPCs. The Sutak Flame Priest and the Sutak Chieftain. So this will give you some nice high CR guys to throw at your party. The CR4 and CR9. So and CR9? Yay. Right. Have some higher CR shit. That isn't a dragon. <laughs> it is really useful as a DM, and this is why I like stuff like this. Um, because you have goblins, you have bugbears, you have you know all of the, the racial entries. And so much of it, um, when you get your first monster manual, unless you're looking at the drow, they're just like goblin. You know what I yeah. mean? Like they don't really, um, and, and like there's goblin, is it goblin chief? I can't think of like, there is another yeah. one in there, but they're all so low CR, but there is no reason another intelligent race can't become a, a terrible necromancer or a super skilled knight or something like that. And so having go-to stat blocks like this is so useful as a DM instead of being like, I need to sit down and create a character that, you know what I mean? So well, back I in the this. Back in the three, five days, I was the master at slapping uh, PC classes on monsters. Right. Like, like, I could do it too sweet. Although yeah. I did run into the, uh, they're never going to use these spells. Um, <laughs> I'm never going to use this. Um, but I would, I, I had dozens, dozens of monsters with PC classes slapped on. Not, not, not like mindless monsters. You know, I wasn't going to slap PC classes on. Right. Tiug. But, but I certainly had dozens of whatever, um, people like and you know i made this knoll a ranger you know <laughs> i did that all over the place yeah um and, and had dozens of these guys so i got very good at it um but and that's the weird of the weird things about fifth edition is yes you can do that but it's a pain in the ass um and to do it because of the balance because do you know how they do it and i love this i i, I love so you and it's I I, I it's sarcasm when I say I love this I, I just drive me nuts. Um, you take a, a monster, you slap a some some player stuff on them. So it's like okay, I I've got a hill giant. Right. I you know, I want to I want a really beefy hill giant. I want to I want a scary hill giant. So I'm gonna slap fighter on a hill giant. And so I'm gonna give him a bunch of fighter shit. You know, like oh you're a hill giant wearing chainmail and sword and you have all of these funky abilities and second wind and all this stuff and then you look at the you compare it to the challenge rating in um probably bad example but you compare the challenge rating chart in the dmg and you're still like yeah but even as a hill giant he's not doing enough damage and all this other stuff to be the cr i want right so what do you do you do one simple thing you add hit dice <laughs> you just throw right? <laughs> like, and even though the PCs have a very limited amount of hit, hit, hit points, you just give the monsters shit loads. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's why. That's like, what you do. Character level does not equal CR at all. Uh, yeah. Like most, oh. even higher, even like level twenty characters are not <laughs> CR twenty by far. Oh, not at all. <laughs> not at all. Uh, you think of it, uh, I mean, and back in the three, five days, it was every encounter, every every encounter that matches the party level, I yeah. should say. Because you could have encounters below or encounters above. Every encounter that's about the party's level, and this was very rough, very, very rough, 
should use about a quarter of the party's resources. Yeah. So, a quarter of their spells, a quarter of their hit dice points, blah, 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 a quarter of their potions, whatever the fuck they have. Now it's just a big mess, and I yeah. don't... <laughs> yeah. I can't it's even true. do that map anymore. It's like... But, I mean, and, and it still varies. Like, a level... While a level one party is hardier in 5th edition than in 3rd, um, there's still, like, two combats, and you're like, long rest time! <laughs> right. right. It is funny because you have, like, um, such a swing in 5th edition where you can have, like, a creature that just gets annihilated and yet like two goblins can absolutely fuck up a first absolutely. level party <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Uh. yeah so it's it's just just be aware this is a gm yeah uh, yeah uh, but I, I i i honestly i just get tired of running low level after a while i keep having to run low for, because of play tests and various things i do as a result of yeah my job <laughs> Which is not my job, but you know what I mean. My my side job. job, side job. So my side gig. I'm constantly having to run for second level, and I'm like, get to level ten. Right. <laughs> so I I am loving that we have a Suchak chieftain who's a CR nine, who's actually tier two, pushing tier three. Yes, and and I'm 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 all behind that of of having this, but but. The simplest thing you can do is just throw hit dice on. Because this guy, the Sutak Chieftain, has 170 hit points. Yeah. The ninth level PC is 170 hit points? No. I don't think so. No. I think that's like a 90, maybe. <laughs> um, maybe. Uh, but not if you're a fighter and you rolled really well. Yeah. So if you did max, 118 yeah. so, for a fighter? Yeah. Is that right? But nobody, like average would be... Anyway, that's Yeah, much high. lower. Much lower, yeah. Well, this guy's got 28. He's 20 D8. So he's double the hit dice of that. So there you go. Um, so that's, that's so you get a couple of new, these Sutax who, you know, run around and you can use them in your encounters, but those higher levels. Um, and, and, uh, and the book itself uh, has, or the creature collection, I think there's a Sutax that's like, you know, your standard warrior, lower CR. So this just adds two new higher level threatening dudes. And yeah, I think it's in the oh, it's in here. There, yeah, there, they're in the SLPG. So, Cardlands Player Guide, um, which is interesting. It's the player guide, and yet it, there's a ton of GM materials. But I believe there's a suit check in here, right? It's not like a picture thing. She looks it up. Yes, <laughs> and he's a CR one. Yeah. So, so we got, we got that. And then the very end of the book talks about um, the other hazards of the sweltering plains. So still run the sweltering plains, including um, a bunch of weather things, which is I think pretty fun because. Mm -hmm. I... So if you've heard me talk about this, I think about last week how I hate the traveling montages, <laughs> but you still have to do them right. <laughs> because your freaking PC has to get from point A to point B. Um, so rather than having the wandering and we do have a wandering monster chart in this there is like like and you run into a salamander or a giant cricket or whatever um <laughs> you can have the weather encounters yeah you can have the weird ass weather encounters so you can have like oh there's like a dust storm or a tornado or you know some serious and the sweltering plains that we talked about is known for firestorms, right. so you can have some Which crazy weather I, shit. I do find interesting that they didn't include firestorms did fire with yeah. this, because the sweltering plains is where the firestorms come from that, like, bombard shells are. Um, yeah. So... And but another, they're supposed to be rare. I will also throw this I, out. I, I almost wonder <laughs> if... When when setting up this book, if there was like a because they they're talking about um, Lucas talking or like walking across the sweltering plains, and I don't recall in Lord no, that no, being he, the yeah that's why the sweltering plains are hot are, are he hot okay did yeah he, he, there gotcha. was a there was a battle in the sweltering plains against Lucas, but it was like a whole region. 
So he wasn't like hanging out in the Cruden like all the time. He went down no. to the sweltering plains. Plains, and there there was a a yeah, the shit happened. He, yeah, he got mad there because this... they went after Shell. They went that's because remember they they took out all the cities of the Elzen Empire. Right, and those weren't right. in Cruden. Yeah, yeah, those weren't in Cruden, and and, and Tulkas was part of taking out all the cities of the of the Elzen Empire. So, I imagine I Elz is somewhere on the sweltering plains. Yeah, or the yeah. And the ruins of probably a couple of other, a couple of those other cities are in the Swelter Plains. It maps. It totally maps. So yeah, there was a, there was definitely. Yes, there was definitely some. <laughs> I'm sure there were. Scan wave, scan wave. I don't, I don't know. Probably. Anyway, but but uh, regarding the uh, those those. Uh, fires. Yeah. Um, I I. I think there should be a description for them. I agree that that's that's a missing in this book, but I wouldn't want them on the random weather chart. Yeah. Um, I I would only want the DM to deliberately do that. To yeah. Me. <laughs> I would not want to randomly run into those because that would be a TPK. Yeah. So that should be the we've reached our destination. We're trying to find the ruins of city or whatever and and on the sweltering plains or, or we're, we're trying to reach the scar right and it's within sight and and the the firestorm is coming on the right. horizon and Hurry we're running away from up, it right and we dive into the scar just as it runs overhead and totally and and, and something like that yeah. that's when you should use a firestorm Absolutely. because otherwise they will just die yeah unless they're all playing earth fire elementals or something it will kill them um yeah, if you've seen um, uh, 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 Fury Road. Yeah, yeah. That storm in Fury Road. Totally. That storm that like. That's actually, I would say that's a calm version because it's not it's hot a calm enough. Version. Yeah, it's not yeah, hot enough. Yeah, because it's to not like on fire. Burn you right. Yeah, but that that is what I picture when I picture sweltering plane firestorm and and yeah, these things are rare they happen every few years not even every year so so I'm, i appreciate it's not on the random weather chart right. <laughs> it shouldn't be as common as strong wind yeah but, for the uh and, and like on a campaign levels that if you're in the area for a long time so for like uh curiosity yeah. cash they're in shells are and so essentially what i've done is rolled for that year will there be a, a firestorm, firestorm. That year? and i'm not gonna like ruin the, the the story but like if one does happen then you know it's going to be a case of how does that affect a city as opposed to now you're stuck out in the middle of nowhere yeah unless they happen to be like running around out in the sweltering plains for some reason during that year but i mean that's a long <laughs> campaign you know what i mean you have to be yeah, like yeah, yeah. it's not like curse of Strahd where it takes place over what a few weeks Maybe a um, couple months. Maybe a couple months, maybe, yeah. I yeah. mean, you're talking, like, years and years to be able to be like, oh, okay, yeah. I'm randomly rolling for a... <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, would, I would use that in a in a very plot-specific moment. Yeah. <laughs> Not a yeah. random kind of event. <laughs> I mean, because that's... Because it's, 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 you know, or 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 once my party is up, not tier three. Because yeah. it's, otherwise, it's... it's it's gonna kill a low level party and you might enjoy this so i'm not saying i did figure out when there would be a firestorm but if there was to be a firestorm yeah. sarah has on the solution vault the uh sarah and her wife um has the uh the scarlands calendar and it's wonderful for plotting out when things are going to happen in the future of your campaign like firestorms yes <laughs> if, if you want if you want a date set we we most i mostly used i did some messed up stuff in my campaign i created a i'm way off way 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 off and we didn't apologize but i created a i tore long story i'm not anyway i'll talk about this story some other time we'll talk about jervis he's in he's in wise and wicked um jervis had an ability that changed month to month depending on whose month it was so gotcha you get an, you got an ability from like, uh, you know, Madville one month and Fat Town the next month. Um, so I had to keep track of the calendar really closely yeah. because of Franz flipping cleric. <laughs> and it's like this month you get to curse people because you spell the next month. Um, and so I we I built that calendar, you know, 
18 years ago for that. And um, so finally, like we, we formalized it and put it in a spreadsheet and <laughs> stuck it on the vault. Yeah. <laughs> but but I, yeah, I that, have found it so why. useful. <laughs> <laughs> but it was it was specifically to track Jervis's wacky powers and when the moons, when the what the stages of the full moon because um, both Bellsmith's moon for like were creatures and the nameless mm. orb for nameless orb shenanigans, um, <laughs> and when both would happen. Um, so so I I in my current campaign, well it's on it's been on hiatus for many many years but but my last campaign that I'll get back to someday. So I shouldn't my current campaign is that it's done, but um for my um my main campaign, whatever. Um it's all about the nameless orb, so when the nameless orb is full is also relevant. Although the great thing about the nameless orb is as a GM you could be like, it's full. I know it's not full on the calendar, but it's full today because It wants to be. Because it wants to be and when it is so because you can totally do that and like have it in its and it's only full over over true drogna and it's not full anywhere In else, else on right. <laughs> and you can do that i mean that's that's got to be unnerving yeah but you can do that <laughs> you know it's just looking at you <laughs> it's like nowhere else like you can you can just go south you could you could teleport a thousand miles and it's a quarter and you're like what the hell but you go back to, you go back to the city of the orcs it's full and you know why <laughs> you can do that with no explanation because I love it so so you've got, you got weather you've also got some fantastic other hazards yeah um, terrain like yeah, poisonous water and and fire portals and weird shit yeah um, and then you've got a nice little monster table of some cool like other threats you can run into um so that's all fun. Uh, and I think it's a good book. I think it's a decent book. I'm glad I picked it up. Well. I definitely feel... And, and Travis has at least had this conversation with us. I don't know how much he's really, like, like spread this information. But, like, because Iron Bread weren't a thing in 3rd edition, they're, they have no society. You know, no. so what you got uh, at, the, at the beginning of 5th edition was this, like, they're essentially their their player character entry and then like vague mentions throughout the book. And so this, a lot of vigil watch though, as it's being released over the months is trying to fill in those gaps. So this is, we had Leone. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So it's great to see this, this lore. Some of us who host this lore show love lore. Some players don't need it. They are completely okay with being like, I'm going to make up my own shit and whatever. But for those of us who want to make it as close to the world as it is supposed to exist, this kind of stuff is amazing. Yeah. Oh, I mean, I, I love it. I mean, I, I mean, as, it, as I've stated many times, my, one of my missions in life is to make sense out of the madness that is the Scarlet's yeah. lore. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, you keep feeding me more stuff and I'm like, ah, oh, I already had all this I'm stuff to unravel. But, but, but it's still appreciating it, yeah. and, and the fact that like people put hard work into this. So, um, so, so you know, it's just well, it's there. It's good. So we got Iron Bread now. In addition to our Manticore, in addition to our Orcs, in addition to um, so yeah, the only book we haven't talked about, and we, we we do need to get this on the schedule at some point, is the we skip the Toe Islands because we started this after that book came out. That is true. So yeah. We do eventually have to get back to the Blood Sea, but um, but we had Mansk, we had Leone, we had. We talked about true, true dogma, dogma, and, uh, the Klingon um, place. Yeah, yeah, the the Orcish Klingons. So, and then our our happy go lucky hippie orcs in the scar. Right. So, <laughs> and uh, next we're going to be talking about the Asahi, the, the race whose name I, mean, I can never spell right. right. <laughs> so I feel like before we jet, I wanna I wanna bring in one more point as I transition this over not all horse people that you encounter across Gelsbad are going to be ironbred and enemies like Sutak do exist in a NPC status 
for example, on the screen now is a Ebalo. Is that how you how you would pronounce it? I don't know. And he is this a he's like a superstar in Shelzar, which I think is yeah, awesome. He's, he's one of our wise and wicked guys. Yeah, so he's been around and since the days. Yeah, he's wise and wicked in the original publication, and he was the only. As far as I know, the only Sutak NPC ever described. And I think I, he's yeah. really why they made them a playable race. The the both both uh him and the Pitterin, um, those are the bat people that yeah. we barely mentioned. Um they were both they were both new races that showed up in Wise and the Wicked back in the day. And and it was like, what the hell is this? You know, because every prior to that, everything was a playable race or right. some mild modification. Like the, there's a guy who can take his skin off because ew. Um, uh, so yeah, he's in here, right? I can't find him. Why can't I he he is in that book. He's also in the Shelzar book, uh, where it talks about how he is essentially a pit fighter and he's like a superstar pit fighter. Um, and. Yeah, he's as far as I know, he still identifies still there, as, yeah, yeah, yeah. as Sutak. As Sutak. Like he um, is... Lawful neutral. Yeah. I mean, arguably, he should be Ironbred, but... And that's... I, I feel like it depends on you as a DM and your story. What yeah. do you need him to be? But... Yeah. So, I again, I don't want to spoil things, but um, on Curiosity Cache... Uh, we have Braca Blue, who's like one of the PCs, and he hates Sutak with a passion. Like he is pro Iron Bread all the way, does not like Sutak. And you've got this guy who is essentially a superstar walking the streets of Shelzar. One of these days they're gonna meet, and it's gonna. It really, I'm I'm gonna leave it up to how Noah, who plays Braca, wants to deal with it because. He may be like, you're not truly a Sutak. Or he may be like, you're a dick. We're going to see how it goes. And I think it it's all dependent on your story. Yeah, it's it's interesting to me because, well, um, Rich Thomas, Thomas? That's right. Um, is the, is the, the lead dude. Um, both the, uh, I mean, he was involved indirectly with the SLPG and Wise and the Wicked. These both were under the purview of Stu Wyke, who passed away before the uh, before the books were released. Yeah. So he he was really the driver behind these two books. Yeah. And then Rich took it on, and then you know Travis has been involved since then. Um, and Vigilant came out kind of in that period. Um, and so there's definitely a shift in tone, from you know, even in what I would call the modern, five E era of yeah. Scarred Lands, and you're going to find a lot of contradictions, particularly um, post Stu period. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and, and the irony that my name is also Stuart is not lost on anyone. <laughs> when I was working with Stuart Wyke and I was like, we're both Stuart. <laughs> um, it's my but, um, but uh, uh, weird. Um, super sad but anyway um so so there was definitely a tonal change so it that that shift in the the while they were introduced to playable race the fact that the wise and the wicked maybe found because the, well, the wise and the wicked was put out pretty fast um because it was it was meant to be a kickstarter um bonus basically it was a stretch goal yeah and um the kickstarter did well enough that they were like we're just gonna put this book out because yeah. it was like every they were like originally it's gonna be like we'll just do a couple of the NPCs from Wise and the Wicked as a, like a little PDF for people. And then it was like, got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And finally they hit the number and they were just like, we're just going to re redo the whole book and we'll, we'll print it even because originally it was just going to be a PDF with like a dozen NPCs and yeah. we would vote every week. And, but there was a stretch goal, not a stretch, stretch goal, it was a backer tier mm -hmm. where you could get to write an NPC mm -hmm. to go in said Wise and the, to go in the PDF. And we, Jervis, we did one um, of one of like four or five that went in the final book. Um, so, yeah, that's the first thing I wrote for Scarlet Lance yeah. was flipping in PC. And, and I also have a monster in the creature collection. One monster. <laughs> so, so that was, but there was, 
there's definitely a tonal change, I think, from my perspective at least, from Absolutely, the original yes, SLPG yeah. slash Wise and the Wicked that came out, you know, 2014, whenever it came out, 15, 16, whenever it came out, to um, what's come out in the last two, three years with 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 the Vigil Watch and the other ones and all of this stuff. 2016. So, yeah, too. Yeah, I think the Kickstarter was 2014. I think you were correct. Yeah, well, oh, and the, the other thing that would have been the same era would be um, Spragos. So yeah, Spragos yeah. Um, and those, those those three things. And then Vigilant was in the middle. Um, and then and then everything since Vigilant. Now, my goal, obviously, is for Vigilant and any, and if any future books in that series to be as pan and consistent with everything as I can. Yeah. I will fail <laughs> because it's impossible, but I'll try my best. So, so that's that's kind of where we're at with all this madness. Yeah. So there's, but there's definitely a different vibe. Um, totally. It's definitely so, opening its doors, becoming more inclusive. Um, the vault, I and I, I put it all to the vault is because yeah. of the, the awesomeness that is the Thoracian vault, the fact that we could do Vengeance of the Shun and that we could do all the other shit that we've been doing in the vault. And, right. and I think it's just flipping phenomenal. Yeah. Right for the Slicing Vault people. Yeah. We want to see your stuff. And you get like a cut of playing in this wonderful world. Yeah. You, you know, your title self. So before and we wrap really up. I buy everything in the vault, so. <laughs> right. Before we wrap up, I just want to like reiterate, uh, Fran did this in chat, but uh, mm. what are the Iron Bread versus the Sutak? It is not a race thing. It is a cultural choice. Uh, they are not a separate species. And it is a great way for you as a DM to introduce different um, concepts within the same race, but not going down the drow <laughs> road. <laughs> so with that... You just in, killed it the same way. Right? Um. With that in mind, Sarah, tell us all about yourself before we head I just, out. I think I just did. Um, you kind of did, yeah. <laughs> so I wrote this book that, was, that, that happened somewhere it's... after the SLPG, but before the story seemed about well, If you um, haven't picked it up and read it, go do so. It's available so. on ebook and print on demand. Make yeah, it happen. You can find me on Discord. I'm realizing that's the best place to find me these days. Uh... K E T I N A six O six five um sixty sixty five. I don't know if that number means anything to anybody. That's my name. Is um, it is it with an S on the end or not? No, no S. Okay. There's only one Katina. I, I only use Katinas when there's already a Katina and I need to Gotcha. So Katina is six oh six five, right? Yeah. Um so you can find me probably easiest if you care. Um I'm on a lot of other places, but I've just kind of given up on all the other <laughs> sucks. Um, so yeah and I've got titles on Solar Scene Vault and um, working on some more titles coming out uh, eventually uh, in the vault as well so, yeah. awesome uh, and your wonderful wife points out that if anyone reads and reviews your book uh, anywhere hit her up for a haiku of any subject. <laughs> that offer is still open. For, the, for now, it will I like, probably remain open until we are rich enough that we're getting like too many requests for this business. Right. But if you review Vigilant, um, Fran will write a haiku for now on any subject. I, I, I long for the day where she has to turn these down, but it has not happened yet. <laughs> <laughs> so, at the moment, I think we owe you one. Um, do we owe you one? Uh, no, I haven't written my review yet. I'm really bad about writing you. reviews. So, so you have to write, you have to write yeah. a review of Vision. Yeah, um, I've read it, Fran but I haven't done the important part. <laughs> haiku. Haikus are short, so good for you. She, she, she just spits it out. She's so good at it. So. Um, and I am Jeremy Hochalter, question mark? Uh, no, um, question mark? I run this here Twitch channel. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter at WH Pubs or on Facebook at WH Publications. That is short for Wanderers Haven Publications. I've had my little tiny itsy bitsy publicating, 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 publication company for many years, um, doing uh, 
mostly short fiction and and game supplements. Yay! Uh, I am on a stream that Travis Leg runs on Mondays with Sarah and Fran and a bunch of other fun, fun people. Scarred Lands, a family affair, um, just started. So go catch up now. He's over on Plastic Age Plays. On like four f- episodes, I think. Yeah, I think we're on four. I missed last, yeah. not this last week, but the week, one before that. I know I've played yeah. three, so yeah, we should have four. Um, what else? Uh, on Fridays, we have the lore you know here with Sarah and I. And then Friday yes. after this uh, is the Curiosity Cache, a Scarred Lands actual play um, set in Shelzar. It's a hoot. And then are you in the are you in the the not scarred lands Final Fantasy thing I forget I am in that yeah and so Chaz yeah, Calendar yeah. who is in both of those games is running on my channel on Wednesdays a Final Fantasy fourteen inspired five e actual play so much to, it's so wordy called Academia Chronicles of Porta Temporia because we couldn't come up with a shorter title right. <laughs> Chronicles of Portent Temporia. Por- Porta Temporia, yep. Porta Temporia. That is and that is that is, is very Final Fantasy. It is, and it is gonna be an absolute hoot. This is uh Porta Temporia is the university that teaches you how to be like a guard, essentially, for for this massive city. And so we're all students there and we're learning how to be um the warriors that we should be, and we'll see how that goes. <laughs> Yeah, if we're, going, if we're going in that, I'm also involved in a, I'm tangentially involved in a podcast called Tabletop Transmissions. Absolutely. Yeah, um, which my wife Fran does with with some of her friends, and we talk um, basically gaming stuff all across the mark nice. from the perspective of of LGBT mostly T um, folks and and how that that vibes. Yeah, so I actually don't I, think I have that. I don't really usually put that link because i don't have it in my I'm show as, notes I'm, it's more friends deal than my yeah. deal i just jump in every once in a while um, we should throw that in the show notes though so yeah, i'll get that yeah. from you and all of these links will be available and i did on talk, this. and all this stuff and i didn't even talk about my little pony <gasps> play applejack in the scarred lands <laughs> make it happen i feel like we need to have a crossover event <laughs> crossover event my little pony so, so you can uh, only play Earth ponies. You can't play, you know, can can an iron bread? So this is a question for the future. Right? Can an iron bread have a horn and or wings? I mean, why not? I, why not? <laughs> why not? Indeed. The questions I, that this stream comes up with in the future is is I am I am I I didn't. This was not a coincidence. I, this was a coincidence, actually. This was literally the top of my clean laundry pile that I wore my little pony shirt today. <laughs> um, this is Twilight Sparkle, who I am. I I personifies so many aspects of me. I, I feel akin to Twilight Sparkle. We we're Love both it. project managers. I, so to me, it's like <laughs> I can play my little pony in the scribe lines. You could. <laughs> and if nothing else, even if there's not a like a um, a reason that you can come up with, magic is always the reason. Magic. I'm gonna play a a a iron bread with fucking purple hair and tail and right? horns and wings. I don't care. <laughs> I mean, you get into uh, the tattoo wizard. magic, and you could absolutely have like a tattoo that like sprouts a horn out of your head. And, I don't know. And wings. I, I you could do it. You could make I, it happen. I think. I think it has to happen. Like, like, <laughs> like, like, I don't play Twilight the Wizard Desert. Love it. <laughs> all right. Until next know. time. Catch you all next Friday for, um, I think we're going to Sothi, right? I, I, I'm going to try. Started, yeah, I, I, I hope I have time this week to actually read the damn book. But right? yes, we might only cover a little bit of it, but, but, uh, start, start talking about our, our wonderful snake folk. Snake folk. Awesome. See you next week, everybody. Bye.